How can I be seen in a society that for too long has defined me as invisible? Protest. Provokes important questions. Exposes issues. Tears down a corrupt system. Carries the torch. Protest is pain, pride, defiance, necessary. Protest is always our responsibility, our resistance, our own way. Protest is still necessary. The first step, not enough. The cry against a corrupt system. Civil disobedience. Activation of change. A vehicle for revolution. Protests will always be a sign of faith. Human rights. Voting. Thinking. Doing. Growing. Being. Harriet Tubman. James Baldwin. Martin Luther King Jr. Malcolm X. Megar Everett. Amadou Diallo, Trayvon Martin, Ahmaud Arbery, Bree Black, Jonathan Price. Protest is me. Hello, I am Mickey Harris, and I am a professor at Morehouse in the Journalism and Sports Program and Communication Studies. Here today with Brooklyn McCarty, and Brooklyn is a Morehouse grad who was actually never in my class, um, but Brooklyn is that overachiever go-getter who is constantly creating and wanting feedback to grow. And, and what has evolved is a number of projects that he has worked on and has also worked with me to co-produce some work that I've created. And so we're here today doing a totally new and innovative way of presenting stories and wanted to talk about that. So Brooklyn, welcome. Thank you for having me, thank you for having me. Hello, uh, my name is Brooklyn McCarty, a uh, California native, uh, Morehouse 2019 CTIMS graduate. Uh, I'm currently in Atlanta right now, uh, focusing on filmmaking, uh, striving in what I can when it comes to graphic design, motion design, and just um, any new media technology <laughs> going on at the moment. So that's uh, pretty much me in a nutshell. So what we just saw, what we just had the ability to see was protest here in Atlanta. And you were out with your camera but also playing a dual role. Can you talk to us about, one, what moved you to go outside, join 
the group and document it. It was hard for me to have an educated discussion on what was going on in the world without having any experience with what was going on in the world. And so I decided to step out, go to the protests for my own sake, and I brought my camera with me as a sort of, I guess you could say sense of security or stability um, or sort of reason for being there um, because I was already so, such a stranger to the activity and such a stranger to what was going on that I just felt compelled to actually bring my camera with me. Um, but it wasn't until I got there and experienced the actual protest um, where I realized that, wow, people like me need to, need to experience this and need to see what's going on. So, so were, you, were you battling with playing the dual roles of mm. both a storyteller and a protester? Because I asked that, my approach to covering the protest this summer mm. was strictly as a storyteller. Mm. And so I had a connection to the people and an awareness with what I was covering, but at no point did I become a part of the protest. Mm. And so this is something that's different. So how do, you, how do you go between or balance both protester and storyteller? Mm. I would say it's, a, it's kind of a tough thing to balance. Um, seeing that the context of the protest you know, involves you. Me as a black man and, and everything that's going on in society right now, it's hard to sort of remove myself from the situation, um, especially since I haven't been there before. When we got to Centennial Park and we started walking, and while we were going down the street, going down the hill, um, Centennial Park was filled with uh, militia, military men. Um, my dad's Navy, so I have no sort of animosity towards, you know, law enforcement or military at that. Um, but the crowd was just, going, going at them, man, just going at them. And I was torn as a son of a naval officer and um, as, you know, as a student of such a revolutionary school with, you know, Atlanta student movement on its street. And so I think I was torn between being a revolutionary and, and thinking for myself at the time. I guess you can say, you don't want to affect what's going on you want to document it. But at the same time, your presence is just as crucial, if that makes sense. Your presence is just as um, important. And your voice, you know, takes it a step further. It definitely does. Did you find yourself in moments where there were people directing what you captured? Mm -hmm. Or were there instances of people calling attention to themselves to where you had to think about mm. the story you wanted to tell and not be swayed in a certain way? It was the sort of um, therapeutic nature of the protest with, with complete absence of a therapist. <laughs> and. Um, People really, wanted to, people really wanted to be heard and people really wanted their voices to be heard. And so I felt people were trying to create their own stories or create their own narratives or create their own something that could possibly be captured. I found myself on the front lines with the camera and this is the interesting part about storytelling, your camera dies, right? And so my camera finally died on me. Um, I had an extra battery in the backpack, um, but for some reason, something told me not to swap out my, my battery packs. And so I found myself with the people, with the protesters. I found myself going through my own therapy uh, with the protesters. Uh, little things, that to me spoke to the journey that I lived thus far, which is more than just being a storyteller or being a cameraman. It's being that Morehouse grad, that Morehouse student. It's being that, that Kappa man. It's being that, um, 
that son to Bill McCarty and, and, and Duana McCarty as being those, that, that individual throughout all these years that people see. And that to me was just um, a moment of realization and a moment of um, clarity into this, uh, this sort of dual life of individual and storyteller that I'm, that I'm now um, finding myself in. Uh, uh, so we're from different generations and I do wanna know if you see any sort of similarities or any, if there's any sort of juxtaposition between protest in your generation as opposed to protest in my generation. I see some differences. When I was younger, middle school, high school, the focus of protests had to do with anti-apartheid movements mm -hmm. against apartheid in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And there was the boycotting of businesses that were global businesses that were highly invested in apartheid, but were doing business all over the world. And so there was that divestiture of business that was a focus. But then protests were taking place. So AUC, Howard, a lot of the HBCUs, students were protesting against apartheid. Before I came to Spelman, there were the Rodney King riots. So that was, I was still in high school, but that was something that was talked about, seen. And so when I got to college, it was, we had Rodney King, let's talk about what happened at, with the riots and um, students getting tear gassed. And what was taking place was something that was like, be ready, because this can happen at any time. While I was in school in undergrad, we protested misogyny in, in, in music, but it was not at the level of protest that we're seeing today. And it wasn't the level of protest with respect to the anti-apartheid movement or the Rodney King riots. So I did not experience as a college student protest in the way that what you experienced this summer. Um, even what I, what I covered this summer was much different. The protests that I've covered have been at the Republican National Convention or the Democratic National Convention. There's always protesters outside of conventions. And so how I saw protests this summer was very different from what I've documented in the past. And um, I see an internationalization. So I see black people globally you know, black people of the diaspora protesting. It's not a black U.S. born in America protest. So when we see people protesting, they're black and brown people globally out there. Um, and you know, there are, there's a lot of intersectionality. And what I was relieved, what I saw and heard were that all black lives matter. The protests were supporting all black people. And what I really liked about that was the chants even made reference to everyone. So when someone would yell, say his name, they'd say, say her name. When, um, when they talked about women, it was black women and black trans women. And so I, I, that's, that's not a part of any protest I've ever been privy to. And so there is relief, there's relief for me in seeing the reach of who's out there. And if people aren't out there, who wants to be seen and what's said um, that brings more people in. So we're looking at us all as humans who want equal rights. So this film brings a viewer in. Mm -hmm. It brings the viewer into the space of protest. Mm -hmm to see, to feel, to hear, right. and it's using 360 degree video. Mm -hmm. So what made you choose to use 360? And, and what does that do in the storytelling process? The real reason why I brought the 360 camera was so that I could feel what it was like to be there. I feel that 360 in, in virtual reality, VR in general, just gives the viewer or the audience member a chance to make their own decision 
on how everything went or how everything is going or what it what that what that moment in time is actually like when we're talking about a medium like 360 or vr it's so crucial for you know for that for that photojournalist you know to look like us in situations like these because we're not it's very few of us that's doing it it's it's the sad truth but there's very few of us that's doing it and um we need to pass that on to the next person in, in, in our own tribe, culture. So when you mention, as black storytellers, um, there is this responsibility that you're not just going out there to point your camera in any direction, but you're, you're, there's intent and um, there's compassion and there is connection. Whether you are protesting or you're not protesting when you capture there's that aspect of it. What makes you tell stories for good? What makes you tell stories that are of value to people? All I can really do is speak from my experience. And my biggest fears are often because my experience is unique. You know, I'm, I'm from the suburbs, I'm tall, like I'm not, I don't feel common, so I don't feel anyone wants to hear me out on anything I have to say. But as long as I know to mold myself for the better for people, then that's all I, that, then that's all I need to do for my life. So for you and you talking about your work, your voice is going to be your voice. You don't need to tell a story that is someone else's voice. Share yours, and that benefits people in many ways, no matter what perspective it is. We want to be able to be introduced to take this protest. Your perspective and what you captured is something that is a different perspective, but allows us to grow with your perspective. So keep, keep telling your stories. What makes you want to create stories from when you were a student, even to now, mm. that don't fit stereotype or perpetuate stereotypes? Mm. I can't see myself or find myself wanting to do a stereotypical project. One, because it's been done before and too, because it gets us nowhere as a, as a people. And so, as you've told me um, many times in the past, to tell your story, mm -hmm. to be honest and, and to be truthful and put it out there. And so, every time I do it, it seems to be off of a whim. It seems to be on God's timing. Would you say that you are walking in purpose or towards mm -hmm. purpose? It's funny because uh, growing up, um, purpose was the biggest word that was in my household. <laughs> um, my dad had the three Ps. Um, purpose, perseverance, and peace. With those three things in mind, at all times, I almost gave myself a sort of hero complex. <laughs> Everything I had to do needed to be done with a purpose. I needed to have a reason to do something. Otherwise, it's excess time at waste. And, you know, being black in America, we know we have no time to waste. Do you have any advice to current Morehouse students? My advice to Morehouse students is to thirst for wisdom, is to want wisdom, uh, and to know yourself. Everyone needs to know that their story is different and their story is tailored to them. So if you know yourself and if you trust yourself, your, your sense of discernment, your um, experience of what's gotten you here thus far, then I feel like the world won't, 
be as bad to people. Heaven and hell is a state of mind. You know, I've, I've met angels and I've met demons on this earth. Like, there are a bunch of nice people, there are a bunch of mean people. Um, you choose what you see. You choose what you, you choose what life you want to live. And the choice is easier to find if you know yourself. I reached out to some Glee Club members. It was freezing. I think it was the coldest day in oh. February. And they showed up at Campus Green and mm -hmm. we were able to capture them singing the Morehouse hymn, which is how we will close out today. Oh, wow. Oh, I miss the Glee Club. No, oh, let's do it. Let's close out with them. more.